Thank you for having me. Um, first of all, please let me congratulate my colleague. We met the first time in Florence, and so it's good to see you back in, you know, warmer climates. <laughs> of course, after I'm done with my talk, you may be very happy that you're retiring. I apologize. Um, it's also great that as an American, I can come to Europe as someone who actually believes in climate change and <laughs> demonstrate that uh, some of our English is actually intelligible. Um, I'll leave you to read that as it is. I also start out with one more joke. It's my, it's like my only European joke, but it's, I use it to gauge my audiences. What do you call someone who speaks three languages? Trilingual. Two languages? Bilingual. One language? American. That would be it. <laughs> and I, I live up to that, um, that horrible thing. So thank you very much for putting up with my English. And I've done something I don't normally do because I had 18 hours on an airplane, um, but I also thought it would be useful. I wrote my comments out, and so I will provide those as well, um, though I am very, very open to, as you have questions, disagreements, or thoughts as I go through this, please let me know. We don't have to wait for the end. We don't have to be polite and such. Just shout them out or throw things at me, whatever you want. When I was in, so I'm going to speak about um, librarianship as is, of course, a technical profession that is all about people. When I was invited to give this talk, Kim told me that the conference and I could address the following. What technology, technological expertise should librarians have? What should we leave to other professions, generalists versus specialists? What does knowledge organization mean in 2017? And my particular favorite, et cetera. <laughs> Just in case you have some extra time after talking about the profession, we'd like you to take care of that. So where do I begin? I could start with my opinion. That's always fun, and I do it often. Um, I could start with the curriculum that we're developing at the University of South Carolina. These questions are very relevant not only to you in the field, but in preparing people for the field. Because the choices that we make and the decisions that we make about do we emphasize technology, do we emphasize being specialists, do we emphasize being generalists, has real consequence for the classes we teach the people. We hire the research we do, the people that are then for available to the field. I could, of course, also pretend to answer the question by framing the debate in which I list some international competencies, throw in a bit of criticism, but really leave the question unresolved. This is what I tend to like to do, but I will actually try and give you an answer. Um, so instead, let me start with the question that isn't on the list, um, and that is, are there right and wrong answers with these to begin with? Right? Is this going to be an opinion? If we talk about are we a technical profession or not a technical profession, if we make these choices, are we just, in essence, saying, well, today it's this, tomorrow it's another thing, I think it's this, I think it's that? In which case, debates often get very mean. They also get very personal. They also, be, we tend to answer these based on our own competencies. Should librarianship be a technical profession? Well, as a former COBOL programmer, of course they should, right? Or as someone who got into the profession because they enjoyed reading or literacy. No, we don't need and so it becomes a matter of more of a reflection on ourselves than a reflection on the profession. But I believe there is a foundation to test our opinions. Because it turns out that what looks like topics for debate are in fact answerable, but only if we start from a firm foundation. And here I ask for your patience, because I start with some pretty abstract concepts, but I promise to pay off in concrete answers towards the end. So, I start with yet another question. What is a library? And you would think after 4,000 years and starting in Babylonia, we might have answered this one, but it's fun to bring it up every so often, and it appears that we're back into that mode here. So after all, how can we answer whether a library should be a technologist or a specialist unless we have concrete starting point? The definition that many in the profession and most outside of the profession use that is, a person who works in a library, is woefully inadequate. If you think about it, and you were to ask someone, what does a librarian do, 
really they get down to, well, they work in a library. This is um, problematic for two major reasons. One, there are plenty of librarians that do not work in libraries. They may be consultants, work for corporations such as Elsevier, Dynex, or Google. And there are plenty of people who work in libraries that are not librarians. Janitors, volunteers, human resources professionals, security, etc. There's a third problem with defining the field this way, but I'm not going to get into it. And that's, by the way, can we define what a library is? Uh, but I'll leave that out for a moment. So if it's not by institution that we define librarians' work, then how can we define what a librarian is? There are certainly traditions we can look to. A long-standing one, and a tradition that is regaining strength, I will call the humanist tradition. Though perhaps we should call it the humanities tradition, as it is all too focused on materials over people. Because if we say humanist, we think it deals with humans, but oftentimes the humanists are actually dealing with the text that people produce. And they deal with text as physical text and documents and resources. Oftentimes they also deal with the more abstract concept of the text, the meaning, the interpretation. The tradition is strongly influenced by documentalism, cultural heritage, and the humanities. A librarian in this tradition is a curator of a collection. The focus is a sort of curator of the cultural transcript. They seek standards for selecting and organizing materials for their patrons. Another tradition we could look to is a more modern one that certainly predominates the field in many parts of the globe, and I will call this the informationist or information tradition. Here, a librarian is a sort of super information processor, adept at navigating data and often disembodied information to meet a user need. Right? We no longer talk about our patrons, we now talk about our users. Another joke, sorry. There are only two professions in this world that have users. One is computer science, the other is drug dealers. <laughs> Just saying. By the way, patrons is librarians and 18th century oil painters. So, you know, we're an interesting company here. It takes us a while. The problem with these two traditions is that they are just that, traditions, and grounded more in perspective and nostalgia than an actionable framework. They are also messy. The humanist knows that the cultural transcript is increasingly constructed in bits. And informationists know that a sterile definition of information lacks the increasingly obvious need to represent cultural power dynamics and the intricate ambiguities of how people make meaning. If we spend all our time in the humanist tradition and we talk about the text that people provide, we often forget the fact that how do we deal with it when the text that they provide come in XML format, come in RDA format, come in the notion of things that aren't represented textually at all. We have succeeded amazingly well for centuries as an organization that deals with human organization of materials that deals with cataloging and classification. But we've now seen in a very short time measured in decades what happens when that transcript turns into terabytes and exabytes and zettabytes, and I'm not making this up, yodabytes. We begin to break down. If you don't remember, let me take you back to the wonderful heady days of 1994 when the web was brand new and what we began doing was cataloging websites. Mark records for websites. And that worked up until about the 102nd website. And then once we hit 3 billion, we were kind of like, I give up. <laughs> Which reminds me of another joke. So God calls three people into his office. The first is Linnaeus. The second is Melville Dewey, and the third is Betty, who's a director of a public library who just died in a car accident last week. Sad story, but get that. And God says, I've done it. I've called the ball. I've called the apocalypse. I've brought up all the souls from earth. They're sitting behind that door. He says, but I've got a problem. He said, when I came up with this plan, there were like two million people on the planet. You were clearly busy. 
And now I've got a couple billion people behind that door, and I'm trying to figure out how to decide how to put them, who goes into hell and who goes into heaven. Linnea says, I'm on it, no problem, I got this. Opens the door, walks through, hour goes by, two hours go by, three hours go by. Finally, the door opens, Linnea walks through, staggering. Says, I couldn't do it. I ran out of Latin. <laughs> I got to the first steampunk Japanese post-cultural, I just didn't know. Melville Dewey, not one wanting in self-confidence, says, no problem, I got this. Goes to the door. Three hours goes by, four hours goes by, five hours goes by. Struggles, pulls himself out of the door, crawling, glasses askew, says, I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. Once I identified every potential part of, you know, Christian Christianity, I got to things like, you know, Taoists and whatever, and I just ran out of numbers. There are no numbers. <laughs> Betty says, I got this. Goes to the door, 30 seconds later, walks through the door, says, done. And God says, how did you do it? She goes, it was very simple. I asked that everyone who has supported their public librarian can you raise their hand? <laughs> the rest of you can go to hell. So, <laughs> the humanist tradition in a slightly different perspective. I didn't write that in the notes. All right. So we deal with the fact that in the information side, we keep gathering data and data and data, and we gather information, and we think if we can retrieve the right document, if we can set it before them, we can answer the problem. The problem, of course, is that we are dealing with social inequity and injustice and divisions of culture and class and race and ethnicity, and simply looking at a formula to identify the right document often ignores the unspoken privilege and power that goes with the services that we provide. So how do we put these two together? It's messy. So what we need then is some pragmatic framework that takes the best of each of these views. Now, this is a framework that has been called new librarianship, participatory librarianship, community-based librarianship. But for this, I will simply refer to it as a knowledge focus. It is practiced throughout North and South America and Italian cities, throughout the Netherlands, and is a major strategy in Australia and New Zealand. This knowledge approach defines the librarians by using three facets. It's all about facet classification. The mission, the methods, and values. That is, the impact a librarian seeks, the means of achieving that impact, and the ethical framework that shapes the work of that professional. As we will see, any one of these is insufficient in defining a librarian, but each facet helps us answer those starting questions. I will begin with mission. The mission of, a libra of librarians is to improve society through facilitating knowledge creation in their communities. Some of you may have seen this a bit. If you've ever run into my name, you see this way too much. I keep debating whether I get that as tattooed somewhere. Um, this can be simplified, thank goodness, as librarians seek to help their communities make smarter decisions. We want to believe that if a librarian is involved in an organization, institution, a community, that because that library is involved, because that librarian is doing their work, that we will make smarter decisions. Whether that's a decision about what curriculum to offer, what taxes, what to do with real estate, how to do economic development, how to teach reading, how to teach mathematics. We hope that our job makes them, allows people to make better decisions. That's what it comes down to. So there are a few things I need to point out about this mission. The first is that it is grounded in communities. A librarian seeks to serve. Call them patrons or users or customers. A librarian uses their expertise to advance someone else's achievement. This puts us in good company. A doctor is considered a good doctor not when what they know, not by what they know, but how they maintain the health of a patient. A lawyer is only as good as the well-being of their client. So we cannot define a librarian unless we do it in conjunction, in relationship to a community, to the people that we serve. I want to put this out because I, I put up, a, I like 50 quotes. I put one out that says, a room full of books is simply a closet, but an empty room with a librarian in it is a library. Isn't that nice? I even wrote that in a book. I got people who said, oh yeah? I hate when they start with, oh yeah. 
So I'm in a telephone booth, like anyone knows what those are anymore, making a phone call. Is that telephone booth a library? I'm sitting at home on my own twiddling my thumbs. Is that a library? And so I said, you know what? Fine. I said, a, book, a room full of books is a closet. An empty room with a librarian serving a community is a library. We need to be seen in service. Right? How we evaluate the work we do, how we evaluate our quality, how we evaluate our efficiency has to be done with some marker. And in our field, that marker is not collection strength. It is not the idea of completeness or whatever. It's how well is our community achieving its goals. So some of the metrics, even the oldest, I think some of the most stale metrics we ever used in terms of circulation, how many books do we circulate, is at very least a measure of success in relation to a community, right? What is the percentage per community of books out, et cetera? So for, the purpose, for this purpose, we're going to define a community as a group of people continuously linked by at least one variable, where they, uh, where they work, where they live, what interest they might have, and as important but often unmentioned, a system for distributing scarce resources, money, land, time, prestige, attention. A community is not simply a group of people get together and say, we're a community. It also has to have an obligation to it. And this is what we often run into as a problem as libraries. We look at communities as if they are simply a, a whole, that people are naturally together. In a public setting, we look at people who live together and simply assume that they all are similar, which they are not. But the discord, the problems in coming and defining service, doesn't come from the fact that they are together. It comes from the fact that they have to do something they don't want to do, which is they have to ration and make choices. Right? For a public library, we have to determine if this amount of money is worth a library or should we spend it on parks or the police or fire. In an academic setting, should we worry about better service to a student or to the faculty member or to the staff? In an elementary setting, should we spend more time with the teachers or the eight-year-olds? That scarcity, that choice that we have to make is often what leads to conflicts, and by ignoring it as a field, we often ignore the most important conversations that our communities have. Where once librarians incorporated ideas from the Industrial Revolution to gain, gain economies of scale through standardization, such as copy cataloging, common classification systems, and a common set of services, and a sometimes blinding drive towards efficiency, Today's librarians are seeking to adapt, not adopt, innovators in their communities. This leads to libraries as organizations looking and functioning very different in different communities, where once the idea was to teach you how to build a library, no matter whether it was in Oslo, in Bergen, in Syracuse, in Colombia, in Kenya. Well, they have an information desk and they're by Dewey Decimal System and this is where the stacks are and this is how you do observation. Now what we realize is that when I walk into a library in Oslo, I should get an instant sense of its community. I should get an instant sense of its priorities. I should get a feel for what this community does. Not simply, oh, this is a library that looks like every other library. And that means that your job as a librarian is no longer to learn the best practice. It is to learn many best practices and then make sense of it in your specific community. You need to adapt things to your community, not simply adopt them and make them. Maker spaces, it's all about 3D printers. Let's put a 3D printer in the corner. Why is no one using it? Because no one cares in this community about a 3D printer. If you look at the Frisk Lab that went all through the Netherlands, they built the maker space in an old bookmobile, in a bus. Why? Because their community, they had people and schools too far to ever reach one common building, so they had to make it mobile. Is that true in Oslo, or putting it in the central city makes sense because that's where the majority of the population is? Maybe it's not 3D printing here, maybe it's digital media, maybe it's music, maybe it's writing. What is it that serves our community, not every community? The second point is where doctors help communities in terms of health and lawyers in terms of law, a librarian helps their community through learning and knowledge. As an aside, this is why we need three facets to define a librarian, because mission, this mission, is not unique to us. 
Teachers and professors certainly will share this mission. One could argue that a publisher and even Google seek to improve communities through knowledge creation. So it's not enough. One last point on mission, knowledge. Knowledge is not a book, or a document, or a bit screen. Knowledge is a human understanding of the world. Knowledge cannot be written down, or copied, or transmitted intact. Books, documents, videos, these are all artifacts. The result of a person using knowledge. So when I say that a librarian improves society through knowledge creation, I'm not saying librarians store and provide access to artifacts. They may well do this, but those are the tools of their real work. But their real work is learning. So, if we seek to make our community smarter, how do we do it? How do we, we do it through facilitating conversations? We do it from time to time, we do from time to time these classes, but the core of learning is participatory and inquiry driven. We support a community member, or indeed a whole community, learning. Why conversations, by the way? Because that is how we learn. This is somewhat borrowed from the humanist tradition, but it is grounded in modern learning theory. When we are learning, we are constantly engaging in conversations with a teacher or a friend or an expert or most often with ourselves. If you just ask yourself what I meant by that, you have just proven my point. You probably also asked what did he mean by I talked to myself in Norwegian, in which case you very much proved my point because I couldn't have done that. Think about this. Today when you came, did you spend time going, well, I think I'll get coffee before I go. Well, will they have coffee there? I don't know. Well, will it be good coffee? Who were you talking to? You're, have you ever found yourself doing this, where you're like in the street, and that's the coffee place, and that's the train station? You're like, I get coffee now. <laughs> this is not a sign of dysfunction. This is not a mental condition. It could be. <laughs> but it's that internal debate that we're having. So we often have these conversations for ourselves, it's called critical thinking or metacognition. We lead a rich internal dialogue where we connect new information to how we understand the world, and that internal dialogue is your job. Not only when we externalize it. I was just reading through the abstract of your article, right? The idea of when people start a conversation, and can we use that human thing to build information retrieval systems? We find this, yes, this is what we find. But we also find that when people have conversations, how they talk, how they think, even the words they use are oftentimes insufficient. It is only when we do it in an ongoing, iterative fashion that we get a sense of what people need, a conversation. So how do we facilitate conversations? We do this in four ways. We provide access. And as librarians, we think we got this one. I got this one. You want stuff? I got stuff. I got a whole building of stuff. It's yours for the table. We do this through knowledge creation. We do this through training, through learning. If you need to access the stuff, you need to understand how to search, how to do the system, how to use this piece of technology, what your library card's used for. We do this in an environment. We do this by providing a space, sometimes a virtual space, sometimes a physical space. But that environment constitutes more than just a space. It's how we organize the space, what values we place in that space. Think about this space that we're in for a moment. Just take a moment to look around. What does this environment say about the kind of learning that occurs in this room? This will be the interactive portion of our day. <laughs> right? Who's in charge? Who's learning? What's your role in learning? This kind of space, now think about your library. How tall are the stacks? How much open space is there? How much is quiet space? How much is loud space? How much is near a window? Uh, the Richland County Public Library in S South Carolina is redoing their main library. And when they did it, they realized they did something very interesting when they built the building in the 1980s. They gave the best views to the books. <laughs> They have these beautiful glass walls with stacks right against them. It's like, you know, Jane Eyre is looking down going, that's, that's amazing. <laughs> what do we do with our space? Once again, a few things to note. With access, 
This is access to knowledge, as well as documents and data. It includes access to others, meaning that libraries connect people within communities. This is a participatory process and means that librarians must move beyond traditional transactions to relationships. A lot of librarianship is built around the idea of a question, I give you an answer, you go away. You need a book, here's a book, go away. <laughs> you need to study, sit there for 10 minutes, enough time, go away. <laughs> to relationships. You came in last week. Is this still, was that a good book that I gave you? Oh, would be another good one. Hey, what are you working on? What's interesting to you today? And yet, if we train here in, in Norway as we did in the US, we say things like, oh, it's got to be an impersonal connection. Oh, please. Someone walks in the second time, you're like, oh, I don't want this one, right? You do it, you know. Oh, it's like us, just give it to someone else. If we did studies, Chuck McClure did studies in the 80s looking at how people ask reference questions. And one of the things he found was, he found that there would be one librarian sitting behind the information desk. By the way, environment, who's in charge? I have a desk. And there'd be this huge crowd of people, but no one would approach the desk until this reference librarian went and took a break and the friendly reference librarian sat and suddenly this massive pull <laughs> towards the desk. That's a relationship that we're building. Right? If, how many people have ever answered a reference question? How many people, when you answer that reference question, did such a good job that the person will only send you the next reference question? Right? You have probably had three jobs since you answered that question and they're still tracking you down. It's like, Tinder gone bad. <laughs> also note that a safe environment cannot be assumed for all members of a community. A library should be a safe place to access dangerous ideas. There is nothing inherent in library spaces that make them safe. That is an active process of community engagement. I, I, did, I put this out on Twitter. Yay. I can't wait for Twitter to die. I keep hoping that Twitter's going to die. But until then, I'm there. And I put out, libraries are safe spaces to access dangerous ideas. It sounds nice. Right? I don't know what it is in Norwegian, but I bet it sounds nice in Norwegian. And someone very promptly, a bunch of people are going, oh no. If you don't know how to read, a library is a scary, scary space. If you don't feel welcome because of your ethnicity, because of your socioeconomic class, because of your physical safety, a library is not a safe place. We oftentimes assume that a library is automatically good and safe and nice and wonderful and people like us. We need to stop doing that. We have to actively say, is the Muslim population feel comfortable here? When we talk about the idea of refugees, do they feel comfortable in this space? Do people who don't speak English, speak Norwegian, feel comfortable in this space. Who are we trying to serve? How do we do this? In academic libraries, do foreign students feel comfortable in this space? That's not automatic. That takes time. Once again, the set of methods librarians employ is insufficient to define the profession. So once again, this isn't enough. Mission and method together are also insufficient. We need at least one last factor. The values we inhabit in our interactions with the community. Because Google can say this, we do this. We give you access to the world through search. We give you a little training on how to do it well. We build an environment so you can do it really easily. It's quick and you can do it wherever you are. And it's mobile. Motivation so it can be cool. And then we grab you for every ounce of data and sell it. Right? Facebook. Come to Facebook and learn exactly what you already know from friends you already agree with. Yay! And we'll give you advertisements. Hello. <laughs> and we'll give you advertisements for it, right? So the values matter too. And that's where we come up to our last facet. The values of librarians evolved over centuries of practice. They represent principles that guide our work. We've already alluded to a few. I should click. Service, learning, and respect for diversity. Let's, to these we add openness, intellectual honesty, and intellectual freedom and safety. I want to be really clear, the one that's not up there is unbiased. 
The one that will never be up there is neutral. First of all, neutral is not a nice word. It comes from the same Latin root as neuter. And while I love that idea, it's not what I want to do to librarians. We cannot be objective or unbiased. As human beings, we cannot. Where we come from, how we were learned, how we were raised, what we look like, how we speak, what language influence it. Right now, the fact that I speak with this accent as opposed to a British accent means I have to work very hard to sound intelligent. <laughs> My president is not helping the case. <laughs> and you guys won't get this, but maybe you will because you're forced to watch American TV too much. I moved to the South. Trust me when I tell you every so often I have to go deep with my Southern accent to get something done. <laughs> if I call up and say, could you deliver a pizza to my home? They go, sorry, we don't deliver. But if I go, can you all bring over a pizza? They're like, oh, fine. <laughs> That's a bias that's built into it. It's we do it all the time. What we can be is intellectually honest. We can attempt to identify as many of those biases and account for them. But we cannot simply say we are objective and pretend that we are so. To this, we can add a general embrace of rationality and a call for evidence, which certainly is important in these days of fake news. So now we have a platform for us to answer our original questions. It is answering these questions that we have to add a healthy dose of reality and hopefully develop some practical approaches. First of all, we have a shortcut to answering those first questions. A group of international librarians and museum professionals put forth a set of professional competencies based on these ideas. It's called the Salzburg Curriculum. And as we go through it, remember the, the questions we began with. And it starts with something like, one of the competencies, what librarians should know, is they should understand the concept of transformative social engagement, which is a big, fancy phrase. That just means we are there to make the world a better place. So, but, but I want to be really clear. One of the competencies of a librarian is to know what improve means, is to have a vision for what better means negotiating with our communities what better means. If you think that having a library in your community or your college or your school or your company is a good thing, you are not unbiased. You are not neutral. And you're going to work to make that happen. And how you do that through activism, through advocacy, is one of the skills that librarians need to know. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe. Norway is the exception, but for too long we train librarians to help people, not to work to advocate for people, not to be activists, not to empower people to change the very society that they are a part of. In fact, I would argue that many of the librarians that we train in the U.S. would look at that and say, that's exactly the opposite of what I should be doing. I should be neutral and objective. And unbiased. My job is to give them the things that they will use to change the world. I said, that's not good enough. Your job is to change the world. I gave this lecture in one group, and an academic librarian said, that's not my job. My job is not to educate. My job is to inform. It's the professor's job to educate. I give the materials and the books and whatever. It's their job. I said, that doesn't work. I said, one, if you expect a professor to know what they're doing in terms of how they get information, see information, security of information, privacy, etc., you're mistaken. And two, your job is to educate them, maybe not on the content matter, but how to find it, how to organize it, how to see it, and to advocate for the fact that, by the way, this intellectual property regime we live under is restricting what you can do with this information. Are you okay with that? This copyright restrict the transport of good ideas around the world. Are you okay with that? No, then you want to be engaged in transformative social engagement. We need you all to be activists for the truth. We need librarians to be standard bearers and at the barricade saying open access, connection to information, all ideas should be shared, equity of access, that's important. That means that we're training you to be activists. In terms we also need to worry about management for participation. You need to be managers and implementers. Asset management. 
Asset management's here because all too often that gets simplified into document management and classification and metadata and cataloging. But there are libraries out there that loan fishing rods. There are libraries out there that loan tribal gowns. There are libraries out there that, that loan 3D printers. We need to worry about those assets. And Univers um, Ann Arbor, Michigan, they loan out musical instruments and a loom, which I thought was great. One of the, one of the members, patrons, users, whatever term you want, drink, actually made an album using only the instruments they could borrow from the library. I thought that was awesome until I found out they named it Shh. <laughs> I can only hope they were being ironic, but. Cultural skills, the ability to work across those cultures, language. And technology, technology, participatory culture that encourages co-learning and co-building with emerging technologies in order to engage with communities. This is not a thou shalt list. Every thou shalt list, thou shalt know COBOL, thou shalt know Pascal, thou shalt know C, know what is it today. Every list changes minute by minute. Do you need to know HTML? Ha ha ha. Now you need to know XML. Ha ha ha. What is it tomorrow? What is it the day after? That's not the technical you need to know. Some of you need to know that. But many of you need to understand that you must constantly be learning. That's more important. The idea that it is going to change and constantly change and that you are ready and know how to do it. All too often, we are encountering at the edge of information science what's happening. And where that happens is not in a classroom and it's not through some online tutorial. It happens in documentation written quickly. It happens on YouTube. It happens through, I don't know, does this work for you? That's where we need to work in technology, not on do I know how to install this thing yesterday. So what we need to know in terms of technology is that it's important, it constantly changes, and we must be willing not only to constantly relearn, but do it with the community itself. Justin Hankey was a youth librarian at Chattanooga Public Library. He bought his first 3D printer. And what he did was amazing, which is rather than taking it to the back room, rather than taking it to his office, he put a table right in the middle of the teens area and started building it and working on it right there. And as people would walk by, he says, I have no idea what I'm doing. Do you want to help? And his parents go, do you know anything about extrusion heads? He says at one point, they had this much plastic around the extrusion that they had to take a hammer and a chisel to it. But that wasn't a failure. The fact that he demonstrated he was willing to learn, he was fallible, and he was working on it with his community so that everyone walked away going, if he can do it, so can I, that's what's important. How often do we as librarians, whenever we encounter something we don't know, go to our offices, go behind the scenes, and not talk about it until we feel some level of mastery. We need to stop doing that. How can we expect our communities to become vibrant learning centers if we ourselves are not willing to do it? So finally, we can come back to our original questions and try to provide some real answers. What technological expertise should librarians have? to build and support a platform for facilitation online. That someone through remote access through technology, whether it be their mobile phone, their computer, their laptop, needs to be able to engage and access knowledge, a safe environment, and be motivated. Think about for a moment the online web, online resources your library provides. How social are they? I'll give you another example. How many people have a policy for a physical library that allows you to kick someone out? Okay. So someone comes into your library, they're disruptive. Do you have a policy that says, I can remove them from my library? Yes? A few? Right. Probably what that policy comes down to is don't be antisocial. Don't be too loud. Don't be destructive. Don't distract other people. Don't destroy the property. Be nice. How many people have a policy of acceptable use for your online environment? If you do, it probably looks like don't steal. 
This is what copyright looks like. This is what to use it. Does it have antisocial things like don't deface the website? Be careful of what comments you put out. Does it have a discussion, for example, about denial of service attacks? It's a social environment. There was a study done in the UK where they looked at teenagers and they looked at them going through library websites and they said, what did you think going through databases in particular? And the number one feedback that the teens gave the researchers was, it was quiet. Now, as someone who played the metadata game back in my old days, I don't know. That's noise reduction. We have succeeded. That's not what they meant. What they meant is that increasingly, people of all ages, by the way, we've got to get, there is no such thing as a millennial. They don't exist. People of all ages have adopted social networking, whether it be Facebook, whether it be Twitter, whether it even be Google and Bing have adopted social mechanisms of search where they look for other people to help them determine what's important. Oh, you've got to read this. Oh, you've got to see this. Here's a link. This is what happened. Even Google is, in essence, a social engine. What it does is instead of ranking things based on lovely determinants such as word co-occurrence and frequency and all those wonderful statistics, it does it by what links to what, which is a social occurrence. People linking to each other is the noise that they use to prioritize materials. How about your website? When someone goes and looks for a book, can they find what other people thought was a good book? When they find a book, can they get reviews and ratings? Can they find what their neighbors did? Can they have a conversation online? Can they learn together online? So this ties to traditional areas such as classification, metadata, but also includes knowledge of instructional technology and information and technology policy. To evaluate technologies with our values in mind, where once we audited databases for use of Boolean queries, set creation, and known item searching, today we need to assess how technology affects community privacy, enables transparency, and supports intellectual freedom. I don't know if any of you in this room used to do it. I ran something called an ERIC database. It was the first database on dialogue. I remember the days of, are we going to license this database? I don't know. Let's see. Oh, it automatically ends my queries. Oh, it's doing it. Does it do my favorite Boolean operator, Zor? Exclusive or, those people are chuckling. You all have gray hair like me. Okay. Now we don't do that anymore. We license databases. We have no idea what's in them. And what's worse, we license databases and we don't know what data is gathered on the people who are using them. And can we get that data back? And is it shared? And what's the privacy? And what technology do we adopt? So we end up with libraries in the US having adopted Adobe's ebook reader, not realizing that Adobe was sending in plain text over the internet who was reading what for how long and on what page. We abdicated our professional responsibility for a technological ability without doing our due diligence. We can no longer do that. So that means that we have to have some technical proficiency in order to audit those things. What should we leave to other professions? In terms of technology, building, programming, and installing. I don't build computers. I don't build cell phones. That's computer engineering. They do a much better job than me. Writing software? Yeah, I do a little bit. We need to know some basics of XML, how to connect it, maybe a little JavaScript on the side. PHP is always fun, but we're not doing algorithms and calculus and compression. Computer science does that very well. And while all too often we're installing them and plugging them in and making it happen, the truth is that is not the exciting part of our day. Right? Two things that librarians hate hearing. One, there's a problem in the restroom, toilet, bathroom, and two, the printer's broken. <laughs> the number one reference question has gone from where is the toilet to have you found a USB drive? That shouldn't be our job. We're professionals. We have other people who can do that. Yes, if we're one person, yes, we have to do that. But ultimately, our job is use. How do we use all this to make a difference? Right? The, however, the distribution of these will remain contingent on the needs and capabilities of the community served. Ultimately, a librarian should see potential partners through shared mission, methods, and values. That is, if your library is a highly technical proficient environment, you will need to be highly technically proficient. 
If you are in an environment where that's ample and you're not having to deal with the technology, great. You still need to know a basic for conversation, but it should be not a universal answer. It should be a community by community answer. Generalist versus specialist. A librarian is a professional that specializes in facilitating knowledge creation across all contexts. Specialization in the areas of metadata, archives, preservation, software, open access, making, these are all developed in response to community aspirations. Librarians understand that knowledge comes not from the accumulation of information or data, but rather reducing noise and identifying relevant context to make a decision. Our job is not to overwhelm people. Our job is not to say, you have a question, here are 50,000 things, good luck. Most often what a librarian's job is to say, here are 50,000 things, here's the two you need. Here are the three. And how do we do that? By conversing and talking with the person we're trying to serve and understanding. And that's going to be different in different contexts. It is focused, oh, what does knowledge organization mean in 2017? By the way, I did not answer the et cetera. What knowledge organization means in 2017? It is focused on knowledge and meaning over form. It means librarians adapting services, technologies, and schema for a community context, not seeking universal solutions for all. It seeks to organize not only things, but to mobilize people and communities to make better decisions. It recognizes that everyone, every person, sees the world differently. And it is the role of the librarian to weave together a common fabric with diverse perspectives. The goal of librarianship was never to accumulate the world's documents or information. It was to capture what was needed to advance the aspirations of a community. In these days of exponential growth of data stores, an incredible diversification of media, media, and frankly, a dissolving common social fabric, librarians are more necessary than ever. What is knowledge organization in 2017? It is the understanding that the true collection of any library is the community that we serve not the books, materials, and stuff that we use to serve them. Those are tools. They're important. They will change. The communities, what they're thinking about, what they're worried about, what they aspire to, what they want to be, that's where we do our jobs. As librarians, I am not the world's best search engine. Stop saying that. You are not the world's best search engine. A search engine's job is to search through billions of documents in milliseconds. You cannot compete. <laughs> Your job is not to know it all. Your job is not to have read every volume in your library so you can recite it by heart. Your job is to find it. And that means that we need to know what needs to be found, and that only comes from understanding the individual. I started off today with a joke about climate change. As librarians, as educated people, as people who look at the data and look at science and look at rationalism, we have a perspective. But we deal all the time with people who do not share that perspective. The question doesn't become, I'm neutral, I'm objective, it doesn't matter, because it does. When we're all under the ocean, it will matter a lot. Instead, as a librarian, I need to figure out how do I bring that denier to this science and help them understand it. And it doesn't begin by saying, you're wrong. What we know from science is if you have someone that is simply has an incorrect view of the world, and you present them with the facts, it will strengthen their view in the incorrect notion they have. We need to educate. We need to learn. And to do that, we need relationships. What a librarian is today, because that knowledge of organization means organizing people and communities, not books and materials. What we need today is we need social skills. We need facilitation skills. We need passion. We need advocacy. Yes, we need to understand metadata. Yes, we need to understand searching. But we need to understand that that will change based on the individual in front of you. 
that we need to build up relationships, not simply transactions. That's what to do. And that's going to look very different whether you're in your seat, or your seat, or your seat. Librarianship is not about producing standards. It is about using standards to produce new knowledge and new innovations and individual success. That's what we're about. That's what we're going to do. And with that, let's talk about it. Thank you.